Welcome to the BBC. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Between Both Cheeks podcast. That is the BBC, the big black. That is our other show. Um, If you're new to us, (laughs) coming (laughs) from maybe our guest's audience, hello, you're going to get to know us very well today on today's podcast, if that intro didn't tell you all you need to know. We are joined with Megan from Glass Ladder & Co., and she is an entrepreneur since 2017, I believe. And she has grown her business to multi-millions in only a few years. And we're going to talk to her today about how she did that, the structure of her company, how she got the idea, and all of the things. So welcome, Megan. Thank you so much for having me on today. I'm excited. Yes, we're so excited. I have been talking about you for so long that I'm so glad we finally got to sit down. So Megan's company, Glass Ladder, is a purse and accessories type of company. Megan will explain further, but I am a big fan because I have so many of her bags and wallets. And the cool thing is that they have cup holders. So you can have a cup of coffee in your purse and it won't spill and damage your laptop, your iPad, anything like that. So I have been known to talk and rave about (laughs) these bags personally, so I'm really excited to have Megan here today. So why don't you explain properly and in your own words what your products are? Yeah, absolutely. We are a vegan leather uh, accessories company. Uh, We primarily focus on handbags and specialize in bags with cup holders. Um, We have water resistant lining. Um, We have versions of our bags where the lining can be taken out and washed. And uh, that's really how we have made a name for ourselves as something different in the uh, very flooded accessories industry. So good. So how did you come up with the idea to put cup holders in bags? Where was that need found? So I used to just put my bags in or my cups into my bags when I was out shopping or running errands. Um, I would just place and pray, if you will, uh, (laughs) that it wouldn't spill. And it did. Um, But I, I kept doing it anyway, because I just needed my hands free for just a moment. And it was just that need there of I like to stay hydrated. I like to stay caffeinated. I usually have at least one, if not two, maybe three drinks with me at all times. Several of them can't be placed down. Um, And if they do, I was losing cups in public that I paid too much money for, or it didn't feel sanitary to place it down in public. Um, And so I just started, well, let me just put it into my bag for 30 seconds to get this done. And I thought, why isn't there just a compartment for my cup to perfectly hold it, keep it upright with some water resistant lining that can be easily cleaned if I happen to spill it and, you know, a padded water resistant area for my devices because it did spill in when I was doing that quite a few times and it did ruin a laptop and a cell phone and, um, you know, I just knew there had to be a better way of doing it. And so I thought, well, if someone's going to do it, why not me? Yeah, meeting the needs of every woman ever. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. so I'm like on your website. I'm like, oh, I could use this and this and this. Uh, this was before kids, by the way, too. Now yeah, that I have two, too. <laughs> oh, man, <laughs> I it's not it's not a desire now. It's a need. I need my hands free because I've got one on one hip and one on the other, you know. Well, and then just being washable too, that's, uh, I wish I could wash some of the insides of some of these purses. I don't even carry them anymore, but I used to often and like the big bags and you pay all these money for them, they're ruined on the inside. And the only thing you can do is have them cleaned and some places don't even clean bags. 
Exactly. And that's part of a further development that we started expanding into. So how the lining can be taken out to be washed. It can be replaced. You can buy a replacement liner because the interior wears down over time. It stains. And then there's also alternate colors. You can switch out the color of your lining. You can switch out the pocket layout. I don't need to carry my laptop every day. Why can't I just switch out the lining for one that doesn't have a laptop sleeve? And now I have more pockets to carry all my other essentials. And the handles are one of the other things that wear down on bags quickly over time. So those are also replaceable in our bags. And we're trying to be um, more eco-friendly and sustainable in that sense where it's like, well, the handles were down or the interior is disgusting. So I'm just going to buy a whole new bag and being able to just replace pieces of the bag that commonly wear down um, is a way that we can decrease that waste in landfills. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, it's like the cell phones with the right to repair, but your bag. So good. <laughs> I love that. So good. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so, as Aaron said, it's it's one of those things that once you see the idea, you can't believe that it wasn't done before because everybody knows what it's like to have you know, makeup spill in your bag or a coffee spill in your bag. I've done it before too. Where I put my bottle, yeah, in my purse and it, 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 you know, falls over because purses are not designed for that. And yet they are designed to be a functional piece of women's wear, but they are not designed functionally. So can you speak a little bit about your past work experience that prepared you? Like, like how does one even start a purse? brand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And that is how you're saying there's so the bags that are on the market a lot of times are not accessible. And that's because to be frank, there's some crazy statistic where 85% of the fashion accessories industry is designed by men who are designing products for women, and they don't even use these products to test the beauty industry. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It sounds like our industry <laughs> too. Before you even started talking, I was like, I guarantee that they've been like designed by men. <sighs> yes, please yeah. continue. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. It, it, that's the thing. It's in women, you know, they're marketing to women, but the people that are designing these products, and that's why I am obsessed with this female founder revolution where women are designing products for women that they genuinely use because how do you know if you're Mm -hmm. not using something how do you know because it's not designed to be intentionally functional it's just designed to be an accessory or a cream that you slap on your face or rear you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah so i I worked at Michael Kors when I was in college. That was my side job. And I was interning in the fashion and beauty PR industry in New York City simultaneously. And um, I started to understand more about the world of fashion and accessories. And that was where I got my base level background experience in the two different areas. One was very behind the scenes, dealing with brands, dealing with um, founders and the other side was, was customer centric where I was selling on the floors and I had to understand, um, that was also very product centric. I had to know everything about the bags. I had to know how to sell it. I had to know the material, why this material was better than this material. What's the difference between rolled and flat handles? Why would you want purse feet? Why, um, you know, why would something be designed a certain way and who is that intended for. And a lot of that intentional design felt like it was missing. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't necessarily hearing, it wasn't so direct that customers were coming in saying, oh, this isn't intentionally designed. But as I'm explaining it to them, I wish there was more I could give them. I wish there was more intentional features. Why is this bag $350? because it has a logo on it, Mm -hmm. you know, and that is a big problem with the fashion industry in general is you're buying labels, you're buying logos instead of a genuinely good product, you know, and um, 
so that was where I got some of my background experience. I ended up switching from PR to marketing um, just because I liked that area of the job better. And that really prepared me for building my own company, which I went on to get our own PR placements for with my PR background and learned how to market and organize photo shoots and things of that sort. Um, so I really did all of our own PR and marketing for a really long time based on my professional experience um, in the corporate world. You know, it's it's really amazing how we as women just tolerate what's out there because it's been designed and it's in a store and we can buy it and we need it. But, you know, the, the truth of the matter is beauty, cosmetics, accessories, clothes, it's an industry that is fueled by women, driven by women, consumed by women, but ultimately run by men. Mm -hmm. You know, you, know, you said, oh, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I just no, wanted to say you said something, um, and I don't, I don't think it, it, you even realized, um, but you say that you worked, like you said, I, why it should have, um, like Percy and this, that, and the other. And I feel like the way that you think, or you thought is it's out of the norm, right? It's very entrepreneurial because most people, I feel like even people in sales, they would have just, they sold, they sold the bag, they sold the name, they work there because of the name, they're selling the product because people want it because of the name. You actually, it's very, it was surface level or it's surface level, I feel like with most people. And then for you, like just the way you were speaking about it, you looked like deeper into it instead of, you know, instead of selling a label, you are trying to like meet needs instead of like yeah. necessarily selling. So I just, that's very inspiring. I love that. And I don't thank even think you. you realized you said it, but that's, you know, where my mind went. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was going to say um, from what Luba had said that, you know, actually um, uh, back in the day, I don't know exactly what year it was, but when Gucci was really on the rise, um, they wouldn't allow women to work there. Women wanted to, that were in the Gucci family wanted to go and work and they would say, Oh no, you can come and you can shop, but you can't have a say in the products. You can't work here. Um, how are you mm. designing products for women without their input? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And the other thing was, I think this is very common in, in fashion industry, but definitely in the accessories and bag industry, I am in, in a sense of functionality, a maximalist. I want to be able to pack the most mm -hmm. function into your bag so that you can switch the liner, you can get different um, styles of the bags, you can switch out the handles, you can add a, wear it three ways, you can do this and that. The, the, the accessories industry that doesn't have a heart to it, like the real heart in the brand, they don't want to be functional because they want you to come and buy 20 bags because mm -hmm. they're not functional. So you mm -hmm. have to buy another bag. And that feels like a very uh, anti-woman business model because mm -hmm. it just comes down to we're just going to come after your wallet, but we're not going to design things in the way that you want them designed. We just want you to keep spending money. So buy another one. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really love your company name and I love your, your slogan of glass ladders, not glass ceilings. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had experienced so many different kinds of the glass ceiling in my corporate experience and particularly in my marketing job, I worked in a male dominated industry. Um, and that was pretty jarring for me. Uh, just as a young woman coming out of college, not really understanding how much sexism, sexual harassment, and sexual abuse, just going to say it, is happening in corporate America still to this day. And I wasn't prepared for that. And I knew 
before I even knew what I wanted to do starting a business, I knew I wanted to start a business. I knew that I wanted it to be something that lifted other women up, that encouraged them and kind of was just somehow able to counter all of that toxic masculinity and sexism and sexual harassment just as a way to bring women together and lift one another up instead of this competitive nature that is really just peddled to us by men that are trying Mm -hmm. to pin us against each other in the corporate world because it's more convenient for them. Um, So that's really where the latter concept came in is to, to lift one another up and to help one another up. We can all kind of rise up together above, you know, and hopefully through awareness and that encouragement, we can create a safer, more comfortable and better work environment for women across all corporate industries. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you guys have experienced quite a bit of your own as well. Yeah. I mean, that's, you took the words right out of my mouth. That's, that's why I started bright. It's, I have the exact same experience as you working with men very young in the, I was very young in the industry. I didn't have an education. Um, yeah, it, it took a nervous breakdown for me to finally realize and, and a therapist to tell me like, you can't go back because us as women in corporate just think that this is normal and you just have to put up with it and get through it. Unfortunately. Yeah, no, I'm sorry that happened. That's terrible. And it's so much more like it's one thing to say that your company supports other women and lifts each other up. You know, sometimes companies say that, but really they're still just masquerading and and their intention is just to get you to buy the product. But I think, Megan, that you, I know personally, you do embody those values because there's been so many times where I've messaged you for help on marketing or with a website. And a lot of Bright's successes have come from ideas from you. So like, well done. There's not many people that I feel like I could message on social media and I know that they'll be, they'll reply and they'll be helpful and they'll be kind. And you genuinely, like you don't gatekeep at all. And and a a stranger, right? Like, you know, Beth and I, we worked with someone in a, in a past life, um, that was like a 1099 and we were asking for like his advice and his help and very different industries. And he gate kept everything and was like, well, I don't want you to take my ideas. What? What? Mm-hmm. So yeah, so- Luba, you always say there's enough pie for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go bake more so pie. That's a good, that's a good saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. And no just for the ladies, because s- you said I was a man too, Luba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking of men, <laughs> because we do have a lot of male listeners, and I know that one male listener in particular gets really annoyed when we go down this man hating path, John. <laughs> and hi, John. <laughs> hi, John. We love men singularly. They're amazing. So, Megan, I know that there is a very important man in your life that is also a key player in your company's success. So, and I think it's very interesting how your company is structured with the employees that you have. Can you talk a little bit about starting the company and why you decided to go the route that you have? Yeah, absolutely. And of course, it's not all men, you know, yes. there is just unfortunately a trend in the corporate world. And this mm-hmm. is about those part, and they know who they are, right? Yeah. If you are not short, then it's probably not you, you know, yes. so it's, it's geared towards a particular group of men in power. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's absolutely not towards every man and my we my business wouldn't be here today without the love support and equal partnership from my husband so 
we actually co-own this business together. And when I first started the business, he was my boyfriend at the time. And I told him my idea for the business. I didn't even fully have it formed yet. I just said, you know, this is what I want to do. And I want to start a business and I have all these ideas and I'm not sure which one I want to follow through with, but I really want to do this. And he was like, all right, let's do it. Like, how can I help? I'm on board. And I was not expecting that. And I'm so grateful that that was his response because it is really hard to be an entrepreneur. It is very isolating and I'm sure it's very difficult to be a singular founder um, to have my my partner also be my business partner was just a really beautiful blessing that came from it. Um, but he could have just as easily been responded, oh, okay, good luck with that. And that would have been okay too if he didn't want to be involved. That was his choice. But he was just, I'm all in. What are we going to do? What do you need from me? You know, and and so I married him. That I love that. And, and so, so mm-hmm. go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say the family piece. So it was just us for a while, um, and we had some um, some kind of 1099 help floating in and out for a while, um, and it really came made a big change around 2019, which was two years in. Our business had started growing a lot, and um, that's when Danielle, my sister, was the first family member to join our team. Um, we really needed some help with customer service and just some side things going on with marketing, and um, she had kind of just been helping out casually, a couple hours here, a couple hours there, part-time. It wasn't really discussed or set up as like a you're gonna join and become this big part of this company and be with us for years to come Um, it was just a spontaneous like hey we really need help and yes I can help and then it evolved and grew and now she is you know has been with our company longer than anyone else she's been a huge integral part of our success and has just been um, such a a good she's been like a person to lean on you know like she understands the ins and outs and she is just there for anything that we need and it's just been truly amazing to have and and that's my sister so to get to work with your sister like that's that's a dream you know like that's awesome um so it's just really really cool and then We opened up our first warehouse the following year, and we brought on some family to help out with packing some orders. And, you know, then we brought on more family and and more cousins came in. And and it's just grown to, at this point where we are right now, um, we are actually fully family owned and operated at the moment. Um, And we're we're hiring and we're bringing on more people, but, it's just been so interesting that as positions come up, all of a sudden, like our family is so eager and willing to help. And it's so cool to get to work with your family and like come to the office and um, we don't have childcare at the moment. So I had to bring my kids to work today and it's family. They know everybody here, you know, it's just, it's so cool. And it's a very unique opportunity. and. I don't know how long it will last because I'm sure everybody has their own dreams and goals to chase, but at least while we're in it, it's just such a magical experience to get to be so close and then nurture your relationships with your family in a totally different way and have your whole team, people that you trust so much. It's it's just very unique and it's a very cool opportunity that I'm glad that we have gotten to experience. Yeah. Enjoy it while you can. And it sounds wonderful. And then to have your kids uh, like come and be able to see that, but to be able to experience it themselves, it's setting them up like 
their expectation for family life is, you know, it's going to be great. That's wonderful. And then I think too, you said you were hiring, you know, that's going to create like a family like and healthy environment for your employees who you're not related to. Right. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm sure, you know, people will love working. It sounds wonderful. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. How do you find working with your family and your husband, your partner, how do you create boundaries in the workplace and separate the personal and the professional or, or, or do you do that? Or is it just like everyone gets along so well? Is that ever a topic that you need to address? Mm. So of course everyone has their own disagreements or I mean we have a brother sister duo in the back and we've got cousins and then we've got a husband and a wife which is me and my husband so there's a lot of different dynamics uh, at play and I think the unique thing about that is because we are all family and we are all close no one's afraid to just say how they're feeling And we can just lay it on the table and discuss it and move on instead of sometimes what can happen in professional environments is people are really paralyzed or uncomfortable to express any kind of um, discontentment or frustration or, or issue that they might be having personally. And so that kind of adds a lot of layers um, to to working out issues so I think actually we probably have it easier because it is all family because it's really easy to just talk it out hash things out and no one's afraid to to voice how they're feeling which is is great I mean that way we can just understand how everyone's feeling or if anyone's going through anything and we can address it you know right away Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And that's important. I didn't think about, you know, on the flip side, that you're already used to being so blunt and straightforward with each other that it's not like, (laughs) whoa, don't call HR sort of a thing, because you know each other so well, whereas at Bright, we're not all related, but it does feel like family and we don't have HR. So (laughs) sometimes that's a good thing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And then Megan, just quickly, I feel like so many people listening, our audience is mostly business owners and in a different industry, but there's been a lot of talk, you know, across all industries, but especially with our industry, estheticians, how much they now have to utilize social media to get their business in front of customers. They no longer can just rely on foot traffic and word of mouth. You know, you have to be present on social media at least a little bit. And I feel like you've really mastered that skill. Is there anything that helped you put those pieces together or what advice you would give to someone that's fearful to take that step or or how to make good content that is relatable? Yeah, absolutely. It is... If you're trying to reach new customers, it's a necessity. If you have your client roster full and, you know, I'm not really looking to take new clients or expand, I'm pretty like consistent with my referrals, then it's a nice to have. But if you're Mm -hmm. trying to reach new customers, it's absolutely a necessity. And not only social media, sorry guys, but video content too, because you're just not going to reach people the same way in 2023 with imagery not only that you won't reach them but what a beautiful opportunity you have to share your voice your brand story and allow your potential customers to get to know you through video versus how can they have that same experience through an image Mm -hmm. it's very difficult yeah. So, and, and that is, is the key. I think when you're creating content is yes, you can follow the trends and do a 12 second video because that's what the algorithm likes today. 
But ultimately, all of that is just noise. And it's great to experiment with, you know, try a 60 second video, Mm -hmm. try a 12 second video, try everything. Try a voiceover, try a trending audio, try ASMR, try everything. See what works. Look at the numbers. And then choose the top three things that are working and do a lot more of that. And then keep refining that process. What what does your audience like? But also it's finding out which medium and content creation style suits you and your brand personality best. And that just takes trial and error. Error. And everyone is learning. Do not be embarrassed to post on social media because your day one will not look like someone's day 300 of creating content. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many videos I filmed in the beginning that never saw the light of day. I didn't even post them, (laughs) but I was practicing content creation. And don't, excuse me, I'm sorry. Don't let that fear hold you back. Just post it, just post it, you know, Mm -hmm. because I could have gotten stuck in that cycle forever of, okay, I'm just going to keep practicing and deleting these drafts. But at some point you just, you have to go for it. You have to post and test and try and refine your process, find your brand voice and and find out how you can best authentically portray yourself on social media, which is hard in short form videos, you know, that are clearly a staged video. Sometimes with lighting, Mm -hmm. it can feel funny. And that's why I think it's important to try a little bit of everything and what feels right for you and what your audience tends to respond to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like what you said about there's no better way to communicate with your audience. And it makes me think if a picture says a thousand words, a video says you can just explain so much more, you can visually show so much more. And, you know, Instagram and TikTok are not like they were pre-2020 anymore images used to be fine now like anytime I post an image for bright like homegirl struggles it just it does not get in front of the audience it's like 24 likes yeah (laughs) it's 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 humbling but really you do have to do videos nowadays for your business and I know some people listening you get afraid and you don't want to show your face and maybe you're shy and there's ways around that. You don't necessarily have to show your face. You could just do voiceover and use absolutely B-roll. Technically speaking, how do you schedule and come up with content? How do you find time to do that? Because that's what I struggle with is like, I need to make good content for it to do yeah. what I want it to do. But that requires a lot of intention. Absolutely. And Becca, I know you already know this, but I actually went to school for theater. (laughs) So I really shouldn't be as nervous on the camera, but it's very different. It's very different than stage acting. It's something that's outside of your comfort zone. And even I was Mm -hmm. extremely nervous. There is a learning curve, but that's the good thing is everyone's on the learning curve together. And even with all of that, the first time that I went on Instagram live, I had an allergic reaction because my anxiety was so bad. My oh eyes, my I have gosh. pictures. I've never posted them. My eyes were like <laughs> swollen shut. And oh I think the God. second time I fainted. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, so that's here, a good... yeah, if you think you're nervous, you're not yeah. as nervous as Megan. <laughs> no, yeah. no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just so saying I'm just everyone so is I'm nervous, sorry. even yeah. even yeah. with acting training. I was yeah. that nervous, so it's okay to be nervous. Everybody's nervous. Yeah. The first few times are going to be shaky, like anything, like riding a bike. It's going to be shaky, mm-hmm. and then you're going to get it down, and you're not really going to yeah. be nervous anymore. It'll be a lot easier, but you can't. You can't do that unless you go through it. Yeah. You know? So yeah. just I just wanted to say that. But um as far as creating content, I typically will dedicate a day. I'm a big believer in batching any tasks. If I'm scheduling an email marketing campaign, I'm gonna schedule five email marketing campaigns for the month at once. 
if I'm creating graphics, I'm going to try to create all my graphics that day. If I'm um, creating content, it's so much easier for me. I've learned is if I just batch it all in one day and that to really get the most out of it and get the best content that does require some prep work. So the Mm -hmm. day before I will do some research and you don't want to get caught up in the scroll. So if you've just set a timer on your phone, a 15 minute timer to do research so you don't scroll on TikTok for three hours, you can do that, but do some research on trending audios, audios that you've bookmarked, compile a list of audios um, or ideas that you have that maybe don't require an audio, a voiceover explanation video, a process video, whatever. And it usually just create three columns for me and it's an audio column, a concept column. And then for me, it will be like a bag reference transition, anything like prop specific that I need, just kind of like an extras column. And I will make a a sheet of paper with a chart, basically a filming outline of, okay, this is the concept, this is the audio. And I'll organize as many as I can the day before. And then the day of, caffeinate obviously and then uh (laughs) and then you just have to get through it and honestly the first video is always the hardest to film you know Mm -hmm. there's the oh I don't feel like filming today or oh well I don't know if I'm ready to film today you're you still come up with some of these kinds of you know excuses and then after the first one it's like well that wasn't so bad and then you kind of keep going you get into like a flow and you're just like yeah yeah Yeah. and you've you don't have to think too much about it and get caught up in the overwhelm because you have a list of concepts paired with audios if you're going to use an audio or not if I'm doing a voiceover sometimes I will write the voiceover script the night before Mm. so that way I record the voiceover first and then I'll record the video to go with the voiceover not always if I'm not as organized I'll record the voiceover afterwards but um I think being organized and just batching it out. And then I have, because we do like photo shoots and things like that here, Mm -hmm. I have like a rack of wardrobe. So I'll change my clothes in between videos to make it look like they were filmed on different days, which is a trick that I learned back in my YouTube days when I would sit down and batch video content on YouTube. So um, that's kind of how I've been able to get the most. And then Similarly, same thing afterwards, you are kind of batching, editing everything all at once and then writing captions all at once. And then, so speaking right now, I have about 20 videos edited and I think probably tomorrow I'm going to sit down and write about 20 captions to go with it. And then I have, you know, 20 to 15 days of content videos ready to go. If you're going to film it every day in real time, it's going to be very hard to do. Yeah. Honestly. So how many, like, do you do this once a week that you take the three days or do you do it once a month or every two weeks? Yeah. Um, I would say probably every, every other week or, or maybe I'd say every other week, probably every two weeks, every other week. In an ideal world, because I wasn't joking when I said I'm a big fan of batch work, in an ideal world, if I can get ahead on all of my work, I love to be able to have batch weeks where I, Monday Mm. through Friday, that's a content week. So Monday is script writing, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is filming, and Friday is editing and captions. Typically, I don't get to do that because I have too many other things that I need to do. I can't just lock off a whole week, but I would love eventually to get to the point where I'm doing that. Um, And similarly, having that same productivity level on other areas like, okay, this is a marketing week. This is a design week. This is a and so forth, being able to block out my schedule like that. Right now, I'm kind of just batching on the daily level, but even that has increased my productivity so much. Mm -hmm. 
I love that. So hopefully you guys were taking notes. And if you want to follow Megan on social media, and she shares when she does this in her journal, I knew exactly what you were talking about when you were writing it down. You can find her on Instagram at Megan's Ladder. And I'll have everything in the notes as well. But she not only shares on the business page, but on your own page as well. So Usually, you just post on the business's page, but you found success and growth on both your personal page, Megan's Ladder, as well as Glass Ladder. Did that just happen organically? Do you repurpose the same videos for the different profiles, or do you find it's best to have a unique perspective and voice across all of your different channels? Yeah. That's a great question. And it's actually one that I get a lot. Um, I think it, it also depends. Like sometimes you're able to just merge the two. You can have your kind of personal Mm -hmm. perspective intertwined with the business. Um, It just kind of depends. For me, the business page is really mostly um, the models. So people can see different heights, different sizes, um, wearing the different styles of the bags. There's um, company announcements like launches and sales. Um, And then my page is more of the business and the making of the business from my eyes. So some behind the scenes of the design process, um, why I designed this bag the way I did, um, how many prototypes that we've gone through to get to the final product, um, what we're doing in the day to day. Um, and that really allows me to have this one-on-one personal connection with our customers and our audience where they can DM me and they are reaching me and we can have a conversation Mm -hmm. that is really cool for people because it's such like a personal connection. Oh, yeah. Something I could never do through the business page to be able to like send a voice memo, you know, and just like chat a voice memo with our customers. It's so cool. And that's, yeah. that's like brand, we were talking about something similar to this in our meeting earlier today. And it's like, cause Luba, she was doing um, visits to people who salons or spas, uh, whoever carries our product. And it just creates so much brand loyalty too. Like the customer is so yeah. excited, you know, they, they love your product. And then for them, you know, to have you physically either respond to them, speak to them or visit them. That's, that's huge for them which is different than the business page, which is monitored through customer service and our marketing assistant who, you know, it's not really a a direct line, Um, not only from customers to me, but from me to the customers, for me to be able to show them, you know, we're renovating the office or this is an unreleased color. What do you guys think? Should we release it? Um, These kinds of things are not things that I would put on the business page. So it made sense for me to have a secondary page. Um, and it's also me. It's all, it's, all, it's all me. Like I'm the one wearing the bags and showing the bags. And people do want to see more than just me wearing and showing the bags, which is why we have models and photo shoots and models helping out with reels and video content as well. So sometimes we will have overlap. Typically, our reels will be with models in them. And that's something that we're trying to lean towards a lot more is creating more video content and more reels with our models for the uh, business page. So right now, we do share some content between the two pages. I would say the majority of it, we do not. And we are trying to also continue moving in the other direction to basically have maybe 1% or less of the content shared between the pages and really start creating more video content for our own business page as well. It takes a lot of work, but uh, it will be yes. worth it for sure. Yeah. Wow. So there you have it, everybody. I feel like to sum up your marketing strategy in two words, it's organized and intentional, which is also the bags as well are organized and intentional i feel like that's a common theme how many brands can you say like yeah yeah it's not very and that's something the big brands absolutely don't have there's no 
who are these faceless designers? Half of them don't even own the brands anymore. They have no involvement. You know, this is like, a, like, this is like a different dimension of the stuff we talk about all the time. This is like the accessory version of the, the yes. br- anal bleach conversations yes. that we have. It's so funny because I, you uh, keep saying all these things and I'm like, Luba says yeah. that, Becca says yeah. that. We all say that the same. It's so, it's, it's like another dimension. Yeah. It's just the accessories dimension and we're the anal yeah. bleach dimension. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's the same stuff. It's the same stuff. It's, it's, yeah. And so you're saying all these things. I'm like taking notes. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was absolutely a pleasure speaking with you today. Um, I am looking forward to, I'm going to go scroll your website and I'm going to um, look you up on Instagram here too. <laughs> Aw, thank you. You're so sweet. Thank you. Shoot me a message if you're on there. I will. If you I end up going voice, away. I want a voice return. A voice memo. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> So if you need to go to the website and get a bag, get a wallet, there's briefcases, there's like literally something for everybody. If you're very active, there's more workout gym type bags. That's a new one. And their website is glassladderco.com. And Megan, where do you want people to go? Do you have any product launches coming up, different colors, a list they should sign up for? Where's the best place for everyone listening to find you? Yes. So you can find me on Instagram and TikTok, all social media platforms at Megan's Ladder. We do have a launch coming up um, probably end of October, very, very end of October. And that's going to be our fall collection, which we're really excited about. We're going to be a lot doing a lot of um, like moody jewel tones. Right now we have a lot of bright pastels from spring and summer. So if you're looking for some of the darker colors, um, those will be coming out in October. The wait list is already open for that, which you can find through the link in my bio on either TikTok or Instagram. And that says fall wait list. And you can sign up there. You will get early access to shop the collection before anybody else. You'll get a VIP discount code and you'll be getting to see some sneak peeks and um, behind the scenes of the collection before anybody else does. So it's, uh, it's the place to be if you're interested in anything from the fall collection or wanting to see what we have come out that's new. I highly recommend joining it. Yes, me too. I'm on those wait lists as well. And it's a it's a fun strategy to see as well if you want to employ it in your own business for anybody listening to make wait lists and have people sign up because then you know they're very engaged. And the way you do them, Megan, is very fun as well. You add gifts and all sorts of behind the scenes stuff that doesn't normally get shown publicly. So Go and check them out. We'll put everything in the show notes. And thank you again so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I encourage everybody to go and buy one of her bags because they are so functional. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure and truly an honor to be on the show. It was so nice getting to chat with all of you. Thank you so much, Megan. It was nice to chat with you too. All the no gatekeeping. She shares all the info. I'm over here right. like searching you up on Instagram. <laughs> oh my gosh! Thank you. Awesome. Uh, okay, everyone. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next week.